Here at Costa Farms, we are all about helping you enjoy happier, healthier houseplants. That's why we put together a podcast that we call Plant Prescription. Um, I'm Justin, and I'm joined by Michelle. Um, she's an IPM manager. I'm a horticulturist, and we are combining our powers to help you um, with your houseplants. Every every episode, we tackle some of your best questions, some plant misperceptions, um, and talk about our experiences. <laughs> Sounds like your uh, rooster wants to join the conversation back there. <laughs> what time is it? Did you just wake up? Is it morning over there? Sorry, Justin, I had to call that out. <laughs> sadly, sadly, the roosters go all the time. Oh, 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 oh. Ooh. good thing you don't have any really close neighbors. That's something to talk about after the episode. Okay. All sorry, right. Greg. Oh, all right. Sorry, so. Greg. <laughs> um, should we jump into our, our houseplant talk? Let's do it. All right. The very first question comes from Ryan in Ocala, Florida. Um, I hear that when you buy a new house plant, especially from a big box store, you should always quarantine it before you put it with your others. Uh, how long is that quarantine process last? Okay. Um, this one's, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, quarantining plants is a very good idea. Not necessarily from a big box store, also from your small growers. Um, because maybe, I mean, the big box store, I get the the concern that there's so many plants, blah, blah, blah. But also your smaller growers, sometimes things may not get noticed or misidentified. And so, I mean, just whatever plant you get, it's good to quarantine it. Now, how long you quarantine it, I don't think that there is a standard, but it completely depends on your comfort level with identifying pests. Um, because when we're referring to quarantine, most of the time we're referring to insects um, that we don't want them spreading to other plants. Now, if you feel there's like, I'm going to use three scales here, right? You feel really, really, really good at scouting your plants and you're really confident in your ability to scout and identify pests, right? That's like, you're, you're good. And then the middle level would be, yeah, I know how to scout a plant. You know, I know what to look for, like moving things. <laughs> That's like the medium, the second level. The third level is like, what's scouting? That's the third level. Um, and so depending on where you think you fall, if you've got your little jeweler's lens and you're used to getting in there and looking like under a magnifying glass, jeweler's, jeweler's loop um, at the plants, you could probably get away with one-ish, maybe two weeks, one-ish. I'm just going to call I'm just going to land firmly on one-ish. That's my... Solid one ish, one ish weeks. Uh, because so if there's two, there's probably two pests that you're looking for, actually three, uh, mealybugs, which those are pretty easy relatively to spot. Um, especially after one week, uh, if there is a mealybug, odds are it will, even if it didn't have its wax or whatever, odds are you'll start, you'll see like that little fluffy white thing after one week, it'll have developed its wax and you'll see that. Um, the other two. Spider mites is a big one. That's a really common one. Um, and then more recently, unfortunately, is thrips um, that are also starting to become a thing um, on plants more, more so than they possibly were in the past. So the thing with thrips is that they lay their eggs inside of the plant tissue. So even if you're an amazing scout and you're really good at getting in there with the loop and you can like magnify closely, you're not going to see the eggs inside of the plant tissue. Um, but if you wait about a weekish, a solid scale of one weekish, um, the eggs should hatch and come emerge from the plant tissue at that point. Um, but you've got to be really good at identifying these first insar thrips, which are, depending on the species, can be kind of translucent and hard to see and also super tiny because they just hatched out of an egg. So if you're really good, you can probably catch those if you're really confident. And when it comes to mites, um, if it's a couple of mites, like one or two mites, um, if it's a female, they can reproduce asexually. So they're just going to keep reproducing. And about a week, you should see at least some eggs. Um, and like I said, that's for the really good 
solid, comfortable scout. Um, and then if you're, if you're feeling like, yeah, I know how to identify bugs. Um, I don't have a loop. What's a loop. I don't know what that is. I don't, I guess I guess could just use my magnifying glass. Like I just squint at the leaf and I know what these things look like probably closer to two, <laughs> two ish, two ish, the very solid numbers here. Two ish weeks would be appropriate. Um, because in that amount of time, these things that could possibly be emerging from your plant tissue or these eggs that could have been laid, laid by laid, whatever, by the spider mite adults, those should have hatched. And then the ones coming out of the plant tissue should have hatched and possibly become adults at this stage. So they're easier to spot as adults. So that's about two-ish weeks. You'd still have to be very thorough about looking at the plant um, because there won't be a high population of them, but you should be able to see them kind of uh, waddling around the plant, <laughs> depending on what bug they are. It's a mealy bug. It's definitely waddling. Did you have something to say, Justin? No, nope, you, you can continue. I'll jump in when you're done. Okay. So we're going to get on to the last here, which is like, what's scouting? What is this thing? Um, so that's probably means you're not really uh, comfortable with looking closely under the leaves, on the tops of the leaves, if necessary. Most of the time not. Most of the time it's under the leaves. Um, looking for pests. So in that case, you may want to let the pests if they're there, grow to higher populations so it's easier for you to see them. Um, in which case, depend. all of this really depends also on the temperature, what your plants are kept. If it's hotter, you're going to see more bugs quickly. If it's cooler, they're just going to be slower. So maybe about a month-ish um, or a little bit longer if you're unsure of or you don't know, like, what is scouting? Um, about a monthish, probably a little bit more to let those populations get higher. So it's like very obvious. Um, one ish, two ish weeks probably would be the safe bet if you feel like, yes, I'm confident. I want to get them under my grow light system. I've got my loop. <sighs> what you do? <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Michelle? I was going to say what you got to say, Justin, but apparently your, your rooster had something he wanted to say first. So. What you give you give me the look right now. What's the look for? No, no look. You disagree? You can no, disagree I, if you want. I don't know. I, I, I absolutely don't disagree. Um personally I I tend not to quarantine. Um I live on the edge that way. Um Ooh. although I do I do look and, and I look for um I look for symptoms of the damage. Exactly. Um more so than the, the insects themselves. Um, which, you know, is not always the safest thing because if it picked up an insect pest at retail at the store, um, you know, it, it could have them on it and, and not be showing real signs yet. Um, I do like to rinse my plants off really thoroughly in the sink, uh, right when I bring them home. Um, you know, and then I, I just keep an eye on them. Um, I also have like personally this, this scale. Of, uh, um, oh, you no, meant no, like no. a scale, not like the insect. No, no. Okay, yeah, sorry. No, no, <laughs> no, definitely not. Not insect scale. <laughs> uh, I, I have a scale okay. kind of of how much I trust the retailer where I'm buying the plant to. Okay. You know, you know, there are the some some retailers where it's like, you know, I want this plant, but I don't feel comfortable buying it at all, um, because I know it's going to come with something. There's the retailers where it's like, eh, you know, there's a good chance, but you know. I figure I can I can deal with it. And then there are the retailers who are like, eh, you know, everything here looks pretty good. Um, so I, I have a greater confidence level. Mm. Um, you know, so so that's something to keep in mind, too, is that you you can, if you want, quarantine, but you don't necessarily have to. It all depends on a variety of circumstances. I have been burned one too many times um, by that with my large collection, uh, particularly the th apocalypse I just went through. I never want to go through that again because uh, that was a difficult one spraying undersides of every single leaf. So I have historically lived life on the edge and it has bit me in the butt. So um, thrips are hard. Thrips are hard. Mites are not. Ah, mites can be difficult, but thrips are really difficult to see, uh, impossible to see in plant tissue when you first get it. 
So just keep that in mind. We should talk about thrips more in another episode, but I'm sure we have more questions. We yes, we have an abundance of of questions. Any about um, thrips? Uh, for oh, well, I was going to say for future episodes. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so let's jump on to question two. Uh, this comes from Elizabeth in Forest Grove, Oregon. Um, I think I might have been overwatering my little Swiss Monstera. How do I know if it has root rot? Oh, well, what do you think, Justin? I'm gonna. I kind of. I talked a lot on the last one, so you go first. To me, the easiest way is to pop it out of the pot, take a look at the roots. Um, if the roots are nice and firm and white, you know, probably not root rot. Um, if the roots are starting to get discolored, soft, mushy, you know, then they're, they're, they're rotting. So, you know, an interesting thing about root rot that I think is a common misperception, and I'm probably spoiling a future, um, mis misperception for an episode, but, um, <laughs> yes, um, is, is that root rot's not the immediate cause, right? You overwater a, a, a plant, um, the roots start to die because they're suffocating and then they rot. It's not like, like it's it, it's an immediate thing. Um, does that make sense? It does, but I do have an argument for that. <clears throat> but we're not. We'll get into it off. We'll get into it <laughs> off air. I was just looking at it from a fungal per set per perspective. But you're right. As with the triangle of death, there is always a factor there. The stress on the plant that has to occur. Exactly. Yeah. You're you're you're. If you have healthy roots that are overwatered. They're not immediately going to rot. They have to start to die first from the overwatering before you get the root rot action. Yes. So, um, easiest way again. Uh, that was a really long way to to go around um, to say. You know, take a look at the roots. If they're if they're healthy, great. If they're not, um, then you want to evaluate how damaged they are. Um, there needs to be a balance between the number of roots and the number of leaves. The roots are responsible for absorbing moisture from the soil. And then the plants release that moisture through the, the transpiration process. So that's actually why the leaves turn yellow um, is because the roots are trying to compensate. There's not enough root matter to absorb the moisture for the plant. The leaves have to start dying because they're not supported by, by the moisture in the soil. Makes sense. Um, it is a really good observation, which is one of the things that I was going to talk about was if your plant is wet and it's wilting or it's yellow, um, that's a really good indication that there's something going on with roots because we can't always look at the roots. Sometimes the plants are really big. They're in a super inconvenient location or they're in a pot with other plants. It's impossible to take just that plant out. Um, so if it's wilting and it's wet, well, that means it's not getting water. It could be either a crown issue or a root issue. Most of the time, if we're talking house plants, I would guess it's a root issue. Um, but overwatering has to happen before anything else. And as a general rule, I would say maybe eighty percent of the for eighty percent of the people, if you think you you might be overwatering, you probably are. <laughs> You're killing it with your love. <laughs> Just kidding. I've totally done it. Um, yeah, a lot of plants need a lot less moisture than than we think. Yeah, yeah. Or you just forget it's sitting in something and not draining. Is more often, I think, what happens is that there something happened, the drain hole got clogged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or it didn't have a drain hole. Whoops. Um. Uh, I don't really have much else to say about that. The only other thing is when Justin, you were talking about the roots being kind of uh, ooey gooey and um, like brown, blackish. Well, it depends on the species. But if they're soft and um, wrinkly, uh, that's not a good sign. Another thing is if you do tug on that like nasty looking root and it just kind of sloughs off and leaves a little string underneath it, well, that 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 is something going on there. There's something in there. It is some sort of root rot. Could be a, quite a few species of fungi most of the time. Yeah. Oh, Not good. so fun, those fungi. Fungi. <laughs> fungi? Oh. Fungi. All right, ready for our question number three? Yes, sir. Uh, my fiddly fig has been dropping leaves the last couple of weeks. 
I haven't changed anything about its care. It hasn't moved. Um, I give it about two cups of water every week. Uh, what can I do to help it along? This comes from Corey in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, man. Everybody always, I've heard this story a lot with the fiddle leaf eggs. Um, I've heard that they're so touchy, but I mean, out in nature, these things are murderous weeds. Um, what's the word <laughs> murderous a lot? Um, or death. <sighs> Uh, so out in the wild, these things are actually like literally weeds. They will crawl up other trees, smother them, and kill them because they just grow so rapidly and so aggressively. It's so funny that when we put them in a container, in a pot, in a house, all of a sudden they become mamby pansy babies because they're literally like murder weeds out in nature. <laughs> um, so, okay, a couple of thoughts. So it's dropping leaves. I assume because it's the couple of weeks. So I assume it's been in that house for a while because they can go through some stress events when moving homes. Um, and that can cause some yellowing leaves, but if it's been there for a while and everything's been hunky dory and all of a sudden it's thrown this temper tantrum, a uh, couple of questions. Um, is your weather changed? Um, AKA, are you heating and therefore your humidity has changed? Your day length, has that changed? Like the light levels have changed? Um, have you overwatered it? No, you haven't because you said you two, you, it's the same amount of water. Um, although, although, if you don't mind me jumping in there, um, yeah. that's not necessarily a safe indicator for plants um, because plants don't necessarily use the same amount of water all year long. That's, um, no, they don't. You know, if, if temperatures are getting cooler, if yep. day length is getting shorter, um, two cups of water a week might be just fine in summer, but it could mm -hmm. be too much in the winter. Exactly. Um, so, so, so that's one thing to definitely watch out for Cody. Or the opposite, um, in the winter, if it's less humid. So everybody, there's this misconception that you shouldn't water your plants in the winter. Um, I'm calling, I'm calling baloney on that, uh, for certain circumstances, because if you have a heated house like mine and it dries down a little bit in the winter, you're probably honestly going to need to water your plants more, especially if they're like mine under grow lights. And then all of a sudden you're adding heat, you're taking away some humidity. It's going to dry those things down more in the winter. I find myself watering my plants often. Um, so yes and no. Uh, but what Justin said is true. Two cups could be sufficient at one time of the year and not at another time. Again, what's changed uh, aside from the location of the fiddle leaf fig and the watering it seasons, light levels. Uh, is there a draft on it? Yeah. Is if it you've just started heating, you know, yeah. and you weren't, and you weren't using air conditioning before a vent might, might be on it now that wasn't on it before. Are you, do you consider yourself a level one, two or three for your scouty sensey scout senses? Have you checked it? Have you checked the leaves? Is there anything going on there on the leaves? Are there any, I hate the word creepy crawlies, but are there any quote unquote creepy crawlies on there? Cause I, I just think that that's a, such a bad word. Creepy crawlies. They're not creepy. All of them aren't. Yeah, sure. They crawl but they're not creepy. Anyway, so maybe check your leaves, uh, whip out that little loop. If anything's on there, uh, again, some leaves may just be the end of their time. Maybe your plant's growing an awful lot and can't keep up with it and is discarding its old baggage, old leaves, whatever you want to call it. I don't. <laughs> so, so Cody, we, we, we hope that helps. And you're able to to get to the bottom of your your fiddle leaf fig issue. Um, moving on to our our misconception. Okay. Um, I I see this one a fair amount on on social media. Um, people talk about how like Pothos likes to be root bound. Does it now? <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so. My, my, my philosophy, and Michelle may disagree with me here, we'll um, is that no plants actually like to be root bound. It's all a matter of how much they tolerate it. Uh, because if you think about it in nature, you know, they're not usually in a situation where they're, they're root bound. 
It depends on what you're going for with the plant. It depends on the aesthetic that you're trying to go for. Um, bonsais, also like very root bound plants. But if you would like a bonsai tree, then yes, it is better to have it root bound, which we won't get into that too much. Um, but yeah, I agree with you though, Justin, in the wild, most plants have lots of room to spread their roots and stretch their arms. So I would say most plants agree with you. Most plants don't enjoy being root bound. Um, I do believe that in some plants that I, you know, I think I know where this misconception came from. Um, because with some plants that tend to be um, water efficient or drought tolerant plants, uh, they tend to be able to stand, stand being pot bound a lot more readily than plants that are kind of, they've got a oh, water, they've got a drinking problem, let's just say. They like to have a lot of water. Um, those plants probably would not like being root bound because, or pot tight or whatever we're calling it, because that means they would get less water. Um, so with a pothos, 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 hmm. <sighs> with that plant, uh, it can stand drought. And so maybe that is why, you know, more roots, less soil, therefore it is less likely to get root rot that way. And maybe that's what led to, led to this misconception. Yeah, I think, I think some plants, um, will will definitely show that they're not happy being root bound a lot more readily mm -hmm. right and so it's easy to say oh you know this fetonia doesn't like being root bound uh but the pothos doesn't mind it doesn't mind doesn't necessarily equate to i like it yeah because well, it doesn't need a lot of water it's 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 chill it's good it's drought tolerant and so it's like all right well at least i won't get root rot you know exactly but Go ahead. I don't have anything uh, else. That was a pump fake. Go ahead. And <laughs> any plant updates for us, Michelle? Uh no. I uh, don't have any this week, surprisingly. What about you, Justin? Do you have any? Um, I am happy that my xanthosoma has put out a new leaf. Ooh. Um I, I have it in a room that that doesn't have as much light as it should, but I'm kind of shuffling around right now trying to figure out exactly where I want everything for the winter. Mm. Uh, you know, I have to be a little careful because I have to position yeah. for drafts, um, make sure that no plants are in too precarious position because of the dogs, um, <laughs> you know, all of all of that chaos. Um, uh -huh. And so and so I know it's not the perfect spot for the xanthosoma. Uh, but the fact that it put out a new leaf makes me makes me very happy, um, and it also makes me want to reward her by bringing her someplace a little bit brighter. Well, you know, she'll be even happier. Uh, I can't wait to see her get bigger and watch those leaves get enormous. I gotta That's... send you a photo after afterwards. We've got one of the uh, not me personally, but I know somebody who does. It's really gorgeous. Anyway, um, the I'm very excited about your xanthosoma. You met Lindeni, right? Or is it Lindenii? It's Lindenii. Ha, I knew it. Okay. Also well, known as Caladium Lindenii. Yep. It is a it, it is a plant that has multiple botanical names. Like Caladium. Yep. Yep. And then and then there's another one that I cannot I cannot visualize it enough off the top of my head to pronounce it in a public forum like this. Oh, just wing it. Come on. I do it all the time. Just <laughs> just say it confidently. Just just, no, just no. Like quickly, just as fast as you can. It'll come out right. Maybe. Uh, I I don't know. I'm not I I'm I don't want to subject <laughs> our uh our <laughs> listeners to to it, nor nor do I want anybody to come back to me and say, "Well, Justin said that's how it's pronounced." Okay, fine, fine. I'm going to quiz you on it for the next time, though. Already, I'll hold you to it. So that's a wrap on this episode of Plant Prescription. Thanks, everybody, so much for giving us a listen. Um, if you have plant questions you'd love to see featured on a future episode, just reach out and let us know. 
In the meantime, happy gardening. Bye-bye.